Hey everyone, you've reached Jason Cole and Jim T. Graham on the RC Group's YouTube Hangout. What's happening, Jason? What's going on? Hey, by the way, I would love it if you could uh, update your screen so I could see you. Oh, Jason. Because that's part of the show, man. I can see you on the live feed, but not on our live feed. How about that's them apples? There we go. Hot and smoking. All right, there everyone. Is. If you're not a subscriber to the RC Group's YouTube channel, of which there are thousands and thousands of people, be sure and hit subscribe so that you can join us live. I am now going to our YouTube channel to verify that we are live and streaming. Yes, there we are. I'm on right now. We're in the chat. And hit subscribe. Oh, it's so like us only seconds earlier. Hey, and I'm moving we're into looking the, at live history right there, Jim. The live chat. It's, it's like my memory. It just happened, but I only just remember it. <laughs> and it's constantly fading away. Yeah. yeah, it's only live for a second. That's what I used to say. I want it live. And I'd be like, man, it's only live for a second. And That's right. Just... Okay, so today we're going to talk about a couple of things, and then that leads to a couple of more things. And the primary thing is Jason Cole's review of the Jetty Duplex DS-12 radio. Now, Jason, you're a hardcore old school Jetty pilot. That's correct. How many years have you been flying Jetty radios? I don't know. Like a long time. What did you fly before you flew Jetty? Let me guess. You flew Futaba. No, uh, spec. Well, okay. If you go way, way, way back, right? I probably started with a high tech, like a Focus Three was probably my first one, and then you ended up upgrading to the whatever the Five was called. Right. That's an old school radio. What was that one high tech radio everybody had? The Seven or something? Uh, there's so many now. The Eclipse. The yeah, Eclipse the Seven. Eclipse. Yeah, I had one of those. It, that was kind of our Hobby Lobby Day era, as I yeah. recall. I was trying to get Crow going on that, and I don't yep. know that it was possible on the 7. Yep. Um, do you have and then, I, then oh. I've owned JR, I had 9303, yeah. I had a Futaba 9C, TCAP. Now, those caps are, like, worth keeping. I don't know if people still yeah. fly them in the FPV world. Yeah, module bays and everything. And yeah. I've had uh, a lot of, you know, Spectrum. I got on the Spectrum train when it started with the this first six. And I've been rocking a DX9 for many, many years now as well. And so before we jump off on why you fly Jetty, let's talk about, uh, do you have any of your old transmitters? I have at least one of my, like my original first Futaba. It has no switches left. They all broke off. No, I try to, like if I have things that are still functional, but I don't use, I try to try to sell them or give them away or let, you know, let them get used instead of just sitting away in a box yeah. in my house. So yeah, I don't, I you know, I. I have three, a DS-12, a DS-14 from Jetty, and then the Spectrum DX-9. And, you know, I guess now I have a DJI radio for the Copus Cinewoop, but that, that really, it's not like a normal radio. We're going to talk about that a little bit in this podcast as well. I know we touched on it the last time we spoke. We spoke about DJI uh, drones, but today my topic is going to be talking about DJI alternatives and I've been doing some research to the point that I wrote a story about it. There's one in particular I thought we would talk about, and that's a Scotty O2. Multiple points of interest are it's a U.S.-based company, Redwood, California. Or is it Redding? It's California. And um, they Home of the Redwood trees. Made of Redwood Washington? trees. <laughs> you can fly. The thing is, you can fly through Redwood trees. And so what I thought I would share, my son is kind of a technological guy who I share things with sometimes. And he looks at me as if, why are you talking to me about this? So I wanted to share with people who did care about the uh, amazing amount of cameras on this new Skydio that it creates a 3D environment that the computer sees. And he's like, where does the 3D environment live? And I'm like, internally in the computer it can see everything around it and like fly through trees and around obstacles while it follows you. And I just all of a sudden find this super interesting at a price point where if you were like me, very interested and you're paying full retail like me, you might just buy one. And then there's some other options that aren't as expensive, but are right up there with like the Mavic Air and stuff. So I'm going to touch on some of those things today because that's cool. my hot topic. And Jason, I thought if we had time, Maybe I can ask you some uh, 107 questions. Uh, maybe. You're a 107 pilot. I might be able to answer some. You've been a 107 pilot for multiple years, right? Uh, like going on three or four now, yeah. 34 I've... years. And I wanted to just find, <laughs> <34 years. laughs> I wanted to find out what you've used it for, when it's come in handy, when it makes you feel good that you have that in your back pocket and stuff like that. 
Cool. All right. Why don't we start out with that right now? Whatever you want to do, man. I'm going to jump over to the live chat and see who we have in there. Hey, Michael. Hey, James. Hey, Boone. Boone, is that one of your people? Boone. Uh, we've had this discussion before. Oh. It's not. Damn it. Still oh. a good, good guy, though. We no cussing. I did a little research about our stats and numbers on YouTube. And one thing I found is you better be family friendly or uh, they really will. Uh, it hurts your ability to be seen and all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to well, really then. ship up my uh, talking. I feel like we should uh, have some Dora Explorer going on in one of these empty quadrants of your screen. There, like a wild monkey. For the kid content. That just looks around. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> I made myself a whole full giant cup of ice water, and evidently it's upstairs. So that did not nice. come to What's fruition. Up, Daniel? Okay, so Jason, first of all, let's talk about 107 and how you studied for it. You used Cliff Whitney's Atlanta Hobbies Gold. Is it Gold Seal? Gold uh, Seal, so UAV Underground, UAV Ground School. Okay, so UAV Underground. You got the you got the courses, and then these many of these courses are in video format. Jason did a full review on this that you should check out. Yeah. And did you did you watch all the segments and take the quizzes as you went? Well, it's it's almost like an interactive program. It's a website, but it's interactive. So yeah, you you go through these modules, and you can watch a video, and it gives you the lesson. And then uh, it allows you to take maybe a practice quiz on that topic. Um, and you just kind of go through the modules. And at the end, there's like the full on like 107 practice tests. And you can just take them over and over and over and see what you missed and try to like learn, you know, through that way and, and going through the modules and studying. But it walks you through everything you need to know. It was it was intuitive. It was easy. And, I, you know, it, worked, it just worked for me and the way my brain works for learning. So How I was did really happy with it. How long did it take you to go through all those uh, segments before I, you I, took the test? I, I did it over probably three or four days, I think it was. But, I mean, it's just, you know, you could probably do it all in one night if you wanted to, if you wanted to do some kind of marathon run. But What did you do, like a, a segment a day or something? Uh, well, there's there's like four main categories, I believe. So you could do that. You could do one a day if you wanted. And and there's, I mean, I think for me, part of the problem is is there's so much information, and then you're kind of frustrated because 95 percent of it, which has no bearing on flying model drones for commercial purposes, <laughs> it's all like a manned aviation stuff, which I kind of knew a lot anyway going in. But you, you have so much information as as people that have don't have any experience flying RC or flying manned aviation coming into this. And it's, you can only take in kind of so much at once and that's kind of be different for each person, but you don't want to get overwhelmed and just flood your brain with just miles and miles of information that you're only going to remember and retain a small portion of it. So you're going to have to just see what works for you, but it's nice that it's, it's there and it's always available. So you can take those practice tests as much as you want. You can rewatch the modules. Right. And then the nice thing is, is it's actually, once you purchase it, it is there for life. So they've updated it. That's so the nice ben, thing about it being online, not like a little box of DVDs or something. It's online. So as new rules and regulations or things change, uh, they can update the content to match whatever the new system is. And then they also have the recertification test and information because you don't need um to know things like weather, there are certain things that they leave uh, off of the recertification test that you don't uh, need. So they have like a section for taking your, you know, research test. You can practice and just let, learn. Let me answer Ben things. here. Ben says, how many, when do you recertify? Your license is good for two years? Is two years. Right? Every two years you have to re-up and retake the test. Now, Sam Clem says in the live chat, he rarely watches the channel because of the language, but I don't. I don't feel like we're that out of control. <laughs> but Sam, I will guarantee that we'll be completely in control. All oh, shucks. What the heck? Maybe. Maybe I don't know. I'm gonna rewatch some of these shows. Oh, he got a smiley that. face on there. He, it was. It was oh, okay. sarcasm. Okay. It's hard to read that. sarcasm. It is. But I get it. Yes. I was <laughs> like, oh my gosh, what have I been doing? <laughs> I do things a lot that I don't know about. Um, let me ask you a big question. Zulu time. Can you tell me Zulu time right now? Um, no, nobody, nobody it's, uses Zulu time. Did they ask you about Zulu time on the test? It's a Greenwich mean to, I don't know. It's like over in Europe. 
So Zoom yeah, time, it, you take the current time and make it uh, military time. So now it would be 221 would be uh, 12. Would it be 1421? I don't know. That's a perfect example of one of those things that you learn just long enough to take your test because there may be a question that has to do with that. And then you forget it because you never use it and it doesn't matter. So should I learn Zulu time? No. I mean, you should memorize it the day before you go take your test just in case. But I mean, there's a lot of things. 98% to me of that test is things you just need to memorize for one time and then it has no bearing on you being a safe pilot, a good pilot, or anything to do with anything right, you're going right, to do. Right, right, right. Well, pilot. really, it's about passing that test and getting your... Yeah, it's all about it. passing the test. And there's just a bunch of junk that is not important, but you got to pass the test in order to, to get the 107 and, and you know be able to fly commercially. I'm excited to say that I... Okay, I did get it right. Okay, so you take the military time, then you have to figure out if you're in standard time or daylight savings time. And that would be, uh, what would that be? Add the, add the six or the five, and then you get Zulu time. I mm. just love the idea of Zulu time, and I want to know why we're not all on Zulu time. Well, because it, it's weird. I like and, the and we're American, you know, you don't use metric stuff and, and standardized times over here. What are you talking about? It's the Wild West, man. So uh, I'll, I have many more 107 questions for you, like M, Mike, that seems like, uh, or H, Hotel. That, yeah, these are. I mean, like, uh, I get, I get Echo, yeah. and Bravo, yeah. But Mike, come on, be cooler than that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know who. I don't know the history behind how they yeah. came up with those. But they're they are easily recognizable names, right, so right. you you know what letter somebody's talking about. Because a lot of times, I don't know if anybody's ever listened in on an actual you know radio headset uh, to tower calls and stuff. But it's it can be difficult to hear and, and understand sometimes. I took the uh, I, so um, I took the aeronautical part without studying. I made a seventy-two. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I was pretty excited. Good deal, man. They did get me on a couple of CG questions there, though. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that you go, you pass the test, and and it's one hundred and fifty dollars for the test. You have to find some place that's giving it. You go there in a real live place. You sit down and take it, and then you get your paper, and then you get your license. Or it's really a certificate, not a license, but um. Or tell me about your experience having a 107. Like when you're out uh, with a drone somewhere, do you feel like uh, you're pretty covered? And if somebody were to approach you and say, hey, what are you doing out here? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, I was doing drone professional, you know, flying for cinematography back when I still worked at Hobby Lobby. It's kind of been a thing I do on the side on the weekends or whatever. But um, so I was doing it before 107 was a thing. And now I'm doing it still after the 107 is a thing. And yeah, it's it's what you need to have if you're going to do commercial operations. If you're going to fly for hire, um, you need to have it. It's It should be something clients are asking for. You know, are you certified? You know, do you have all the stuff? That's just one of the things that they're looking for. Um, and it's illegal to do it otherwise if you don't have it, unless you have the 333 exemption, which is still around for some weird reason. But you can still have that and fly commercially but you want your 107 and yeah i mean it's it's what's going to allow you to do commercial operations that's the only reason you would get it you don't need it to be a recreational pilot you're not going to need it to have fun go out and play but if you're gonna i'm gonna go shoot this guy's real estate you know right house for 50 bucks and he's gonna pay me to do that and you need you need to have it for stuff like that gotcha all right well i was just curious uh other things that I've been interested in lately. So let's move on to the DS. And when we get there, I my assumption was when you jumped over to Jetty, it was because of all the cell plane pluses that a Jetty radio afforded you. Is that the truth? What's a, that's, a, it's, that's exactly really close to how I started. So I was flying a DX9, which I still love. It's a great radio. Um, but I was it was when I was just getting into discus launch gliders. Before I was competing you know, on a, on a high level and, and doing that, just wanting to use it. They're, they're really challenging because you, you have a launch mode preset. I don't know if I've really gone through the how, so how DLG works before on the show, but uh, basically when we launch, we want to have a, a certain amount of up elevator um, as we come around and swing the airplane. 
Um, we don't throw it at an upward angle because you lose a lot of energy that way. So, cause you, you throw it like horizontally, like at, straight out at the horizon. You throw it flat level. And then what happens is you're holding a switch or a button and that puts in up elevator. And then so when the plane releases from your hands, it instantly pitches up. And the way it works is, is normally it's either a momentary button or a momentary switch. So you kind of hold it to, to add the up elevator preset. And when you let go, you release the button or release the switch and it spring loads to a position that doesn't have the elevator you know, up deflected. So that way it kind of pitches up instantly and then flies straight to go through what we call a zoom launch. Now, the tricky part is, is there's a lot that goes into it in the programming, but I couldn't do what I needed it to do with the DX9. It didn't have the ability to have minimum a three position spring loaded on one way switch that I could modify and put on the right hand side of the radio for me being a left handed pilot. Question. Do yeah. you have a transmitter nearby to I hold do. in your hand while I do. you discuss? All right. Bing, bing, bing. The Jedi radio. I thought maybe you could uh, demonstrate with the actual unit. Yeah. So, well, okay. Yeah. So, the, so what I, I was having a problem with being able to do it, I was having to make really weird workarounds and, and losing the ability to do things like quick turns where I could grab the plane and instantly throw it back by just pushing a switch in. I, I would have to like put this throttle stick all the way back up, move this switch and then hold it and then grab the plane. And it was cumbersome to be able to do that well. Now, a lot of guys can fly it and it, I think it just depends on if you're a left-handed pilot or not. I think right-handed pilots with whatever switch they have on that side, you can make it work like you want to. But I needed something that worked for a left-handed pilot for me and that was the Jetty. So I ended up with the DS-14 originally. And back then I had, um, a three position. I don't think I have one on this radio because I've switched because of something I found out, which is really cool. But anyway, I had a three position switch. It'd be like this little long switch here. And so I would hold it for launch mode. I would let go for zoom mode. And, you know, it's climbing, climbing, climbing. And then on the way up, I could move it back into the third position. And then it flies like normal. The trick is, is your throttle stick on a DLG controls the flaps. So when this throttle stick is up, the flaps are up, you know, in the neutral position. And as you pull down, um, the flaps come down as air brakes. So on a quick turn, um, you're coming in and you've got brakes activated to slow the airplane down so you can grab it. And then when you hit launch mode and go into zoom mode, in both of those modes, the flaps are disabled. So it doesn't matter where the stick is. So I'm coming in, I grab the plane, hit the switch, the flaps are instantly disabled and they go to level. And they stay that way until I come out of zoom mode. So on the way up, all I have to do is think about is just moving the throttle stick back up, which is kind of just second nature to me. You just do it. And then as soon as I push over with my elevator at the top of the climb, that puts it out of zoom mode. So that's like a switch almost. Uh, moving the elevator stick to, to pull over at the top. And then and then my flaps are activated again because I'm out of launch or zoom mode. So it's just really fancy. And then that was one of the things I liked was it had all the programming functions. It was really intuitive, easy, and very powerful, um, very capable, did a lot of stuff, but also that you can move switches around. So I used to have that same three position switch on this right hand side, um, but now I've got a push button. Ah. So that's something new I've added this year. So I was able to take that switch out. It's just a little ribbon cable and you can easily swap them, move them around, do whatever you want. So now I just, I land, hold that button in, release that button, momentary switch, push the elevator at the top. And then I'm, I can activate all my modes with ease and without screwing anything up or trying to launch with the flaps down and breaking the plane and doing all that stuff. So that was what got me into Jetty was the beginning was being able to modify the switches and, and customize it kind of to how I needed it to work for discus launch gliders. So what we should do now, do you want to go take a look at your uh, review? Sure. Yeah. And so the review for me, like the radio is so powerful and so, you know, just there's a lot, lot, lot to it. I didn't want to do this like 50 page long review of every covering everything. I just wanted to really talk about it 
for use with DLGs for me personally. So it was more of a, um, here's what I'm using it for and what I like about it and why I like it for discus launch gliders. But you can see, you know, it's kind of got all the normal traditional review stuff, all the what it comes with shots, the beauty shots on the studio, that kind of stuff. Mm, beautiful. And I love that color screen, man. Is it a touch screen? <laughs> it's not a touch screen, which I love. I don't want a touch screen on my mm, radio. You don't want to be touch touching. Screens are, I mean, unless it's, <laughs> hang on, I'm coughing. <clears throat> Woo. So anything that's not a phone for me, like the touch screens are terrible. They're slow or laggy or they don't, you know, don't work kind of like an iPhone, right? Or a nice quality high-end cell phone screen. So I don't want a junk touch screen on my radio. I want these physical buttons that you see below the screen there and it, and the the scroll wheel. It's just much more intuitive and, and easy to use for me. It's, it's physical, it's tactile. You can do it while not even looking at the radio. Um, so I don't want a touch screen. That's me personally. But what I do love about the screen is I was kind of jealous of the DS24s because my DS14 is a flat, you know, monotone, monocolor, single color screen, kind of like an old LCD digital display. And then the 24s came out and they had this beautiful color screen with customizable things and pictures and all stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's the future, man. That's what I want. And it wasn't available. I, I wasn't going to purchase a 24. They're really expensive. Then the 12 came out, and I was like, all right, an affordable radio that has this. But the best part about this screen over something like my DS14 is you can wear polarized sunglasses and see the screen perfectly fine. Ah. And that's a game changer for pilots, right? You're out there. A lot of us wear polarized sunglasses. And to not have to do that, tilt your head up and look down between your sunglasses to see the screen and make changes. You can just look straight on with the sunglasses on. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So that's your old radio? So there's the, or, yeah, it's the DS14 on the left and the 12 on the right. It's a little bit smaller, but the, and the other key here is the DS14 is aluminum case. It's really solid, but very heavy. And as I was spinning around launching at the team selects, I was going to lose the radio. I almost threw it, um, you know, unintentionally just slipping out of my hands kind of because it just got, my hands got sweaty. The radio is really heavy. So the DS12 is just a whole lot lighter and it's just perfectly suited for uh, spinning around with the with the discus launch glider and throwing. So it's it's for me, it's the ultimate DLG radio right now. I love this thing. Totally different screen too. Is that encryption tape on there? Is that where yeah, you're so I goes? found this stuff on Amazon, just some kind of grip tape, and I ended up yeah, so I have a section on the radio and then on the back it's hard to see because it's black on black but you can see a little bit of what it looks like on the ds14 there on the left and then here we're looking at how bright this uh is compared to the old yeah so it's it's bright it's easy there's multiple color options so you can customize it if you wanted to make it different colors uh, there's only two two-tone colors like this one's kind of yellow and blue and there's like a a red and a like a pastel yellow and then there's single colors and a bunch of different ones you can scroll through. But I think it matched the color of their body. So that's why I went with that scheme. Oh, wow. And how hard is it to pop this up? It's it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's like, it's like seven screws. They give you the tools. And, and so here's uh, your ribbon modules. And then yeah, you just so there's your ribbons for the switches. They just plug in, plug out. It's a piece of cake. Just to look at the back, and there is some other stuff here that I'm not too familiar with is expansion modules. There's extra slots in there for adding on different things at some point. It's kind of interesting. Then we have the weight, 12.4. 1,200 grams versus 732 oh. grams. It's a lot lighter, man, and it, you can feel it instantly. And so here's – so. On that shot right there, that's this is the map, and it can be kind of confusing. So they sell it as a, a base radio, or you can add on these AB Deluxe packages to get all these different features. So what they try to do is, is it's a high-quality radio. The gimbals are the best gimbals I've ever flown. Everything's quality, you know, as far as the radio goes. Even the software is amazing. But instead of it being a, a $2,000 radio, they, they sell it as a base package and then leave off some functionality to it. Um, so you can purchase add-ons. So if you need more 
uh, options. You can see the list there. But one of the guys was, he's like, Jason, so what would I need to do a DLG kind of like you have your setup? And I was like, well, you're going to need more than three flight modes because that's what it comes with stock in order to do the full DLG. You need five kind of minimum. Um, so you're going to need to upgrade that. That's 25 bucks. Um, you're probably going to want to do logical switches if you want to do the push button launch mode, zoom mode, push the elevator stick up to get out of zoom mode. That's a logical switch setup. So you're going to need those. So that's another 15 bucks. And then uh, maybe you want audible alerts um, to read, to tell you I'm in cruise mode, launch mode, thermal mode, whatever. I think that's another 25 bucks. So I was like, that's all. You don't really need any of these other things to be able to fly DLG or do this. It's just kind of up to you. So you don't have to spend an extra $140 on this A package or B package or deluxe. You can spend, you know, 50, 60 bucks and, and get only the things that you want. So you can pick and choose. Well, I think it's kind of a cool way to do it. So you don't pay for things you don't want. And it's reasonable pricing. Yeah. There's your internal antenna structures. No, that is somebody else's picture in the thread of oh. an antenna in a DS24 or 14, I think. I, 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 just, I follow the thread, so I know that picture. Hey, everyone. It's Jason Cole, and hey, today hey. we're looking at the Jetty Duplex. Boone says he saw I've, – I've seen this video, too – the, of a guy on Facebook that's getting ready to launch and he's got a camera on the ground and he goes to throw, but he slips. And they're kind of joking about, you know, wearing the right shoes, but he slips and then slams the plane into the ground and the wing is all broken half. And you just, Oh yeah. I feel bad too, man. I, uh, when I was throwing, I threw and hit the elevator. I was like, I'm going to really throw it hard. And, uh, so as soon as it left my hand, it went up and then straight into the dirt, like yeah. an arrow. Yeah. And it went, it like impelled itself into the dirt, and then the energy took the tail of the plane and snapped it. Yeah, it there's awesome. always somebody at a contest too, because it, it's kind of when a plane like really cracks or smashes or hits the ground or does something, it kind of sounds like somebody stomping on a water bottle, an empty water bottle. So inevitably, somebody at the field just slams down on a water bottle, and everybody's like, "Oh!" But it was just somebody ah, playing a joke on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kind of like that that uh, finger popping trick where you put it behind your back. Oh yeah. Anything in this video we need to see? No, I just kind of go through and talk about the features that I like and what I'm using and the um, the Lua apps that I'm using and the F3K training kind of stuff and the pictures. That's what I'm talking about right now. Is you can have pictures. You can if you have a lot of the same airplane or similar planes, you can easily you know see which plane you're trying to control on the radio. Now, Jason, you know I'm an idea man, and I just had yes, an sir. idea, man. What's your idea? I think they should have a fi flight simulator pre-installed. And so, mm. like, if you're at home, you just turn the screen on and you flight sim your sailplane or whatever. That's off the transfer. pretty dang cool, man. Yeah. I don't know hey. that it has the horsepower to handle a simulator, but I don't maybe. know. Uh, ZB, if you're listening, uh, I get 15% uh, uh, of that idea. So they're asking, what's the cost of that radio? Let me see what he's got it at right now. There's that grip tape right there. So Spree models, who carries them in the United States? There's other places across the world that have them. The DS-12 looks like anywhere, depending on packages, from $595 to $960, depending on well, let's go look. Base, base to uh, package ratio so you've got the basic package is 595 package a is 735 b 885 and the full-on deluxe is 960. I miss and it's fully telemetry enabled and there's there's a lot to like about it well there you have it so this is your main radio right now mm-hmm well, it depends. Like, there's, I still have the DS14, and there's some differences, right? So the DS14 has two 2.4 gigahertz modules in it, and the DS12 only has one, but it also has a 900 megahertz module in it that you can use as a backup, which isn't out yet in the United States. So here's where that comes into play for me. I fly also big carbon fiber F5J cell planes as well. 
And in those, it's a lot of carbon. So I want kind of some redundancy. So I have two receivers. So I have one receiver, you know, out in front of the wing and I have one receiver with antenna sticking out behind the wing. So I can make sure they don't get blocked by any of the carbon uh, fuselage or wing section. So the DS-14 can have dual kind of simultaneously talking to two receivers with two different modules in the radio, which is kind of cool. DS-12 can't do that. But when the 900 stuff finally comes out, um, you will be able to put in a 900 megahertz backup receiver system. So if the 2.4 uh, signal gets degraded or quality or is blocked or something, it fails over to the 900, which is, everybody, as everybody knows, can go much longer range and, and is a, you know, just a wider sine wave, so you get better penetration. Um, so it should be a really safe alternative backup if you're flying fairly long range. Yeah, Sim, so the car carbon fiber blocks RF big time. So you we can't even have our antennas on the inside of the fuselages that are carbon fuselages um, because it just, it just kills it. You won't get very far at all before the radio cuts out. So you have to have little whisker antennas poking out the sides or what a lot of the discus launch gliders do will have a carbon fiber fuselage up into just after the front of the wing and then it's all kevlar or uh, fiberglass or some material that is rf transparent and allows the signals to go through so you can have your antennas on the inside at the front of the fuselage to get your signal um, through but the carbon definitely is not a not a good thing to have blocking your signal and you keep those whiskers in to uh, get better aerodynamics. Yeah, so it's, yeah, there's obviously, if you have whiskers poking out, there's more drag. I don't really notice it so much. I've got big whiskers, probably like that long, poking out of my uh, Neutrino F5J plane. I don't, doesn't bother me one bit. I'd rather have, make sure I get a good signal than, than be a little bit slightly less draggy. So if you have any questions about that transmitter, be sure and check out the review. You can also post there if you want. And I'm sure Jason will answer any question you have at any time of the day. Certainly. I'm subscribed to the thread, so I would see it. If you look in the description, I'm going to give you Jason's cell phone number. You can call it. There you go. 555. All, right. <laughs> All right. So let's go look at. Oh, here. One cool thing. Sorry. Oh, before, before you look at something. Yes. Um, I was talking about the the selector knob that you use to scroll through. It's like this little wheel that's a push button, but you know rotates left and right. It's plastic on the DS12. It's plastic on my DS14. I didn't even know there was anything different because it's all I've ever had. But some people think it's pretty slick, and the one on the DS24 is metal, and they said it just feels better to them. And I said, I don't know that I've ever tried the DS24 one, but ZB is ordering those for parts because you can buy that as a spare part and then put it on your DS12 or your DS14 and then have a metal selector. And uh, I thought, I'm like, I have to try that. So I'm probably going to buy that when it's available and, and put it on there. But I was like, I don't have any problems with this plastic one, but uh, some people thought it was slippery and they wanted the metal one. So I just Plus think that's kind of awesome. neat. You can pimp your uh, transmitter. It's awesome. What about the video signal for FPV? Sam asked. Yeah, same thing. It's uh, it's uh, that's a 5.8 gigahertz, still a, still an RF video signal, and uh, if a lot of times you'll have to have your antennas try to get mounted away from the carbon fiber body of the drone, and depending on the drone, it you know might be easy to do or not easy to do, but you want to try to get your antennas as far away from the carbon as possible for the best quality RF signal. I'm looking at the live chat. What else? I guess that's it. There you go. All right. Well, let's move into another interesting topic. Scotty O. Let me move my little window down. Maybe I'll move it over. So this is the Scotty O2. There was a Scotty O1 that didn't look anything like the Scotty O2. The Scotty O1 uh, looked almost like a big bar with that happened to have uh, props on the side. Right. Yep. And I watched a very long interview with the, uh, one of the, I don't think it was a CEO, but maybe the second in command at Scadio. And they were talking about uh, all the suggestions they received and people calling in with issues. And they used all of that to build the Scadio too. There's one concern. There's a lot of cool stuff. The only concern I have is would I, if I wanted to buy one today, would I be able to get one because demand is so high on these things? 
So um, in this article, basically what I'm looking at is um, if you're not, let's say that you were not going pro, you weren't going to work on a music video or a TV commercial, but you wanted to have great uh, cinematic shots from the sky for whatever, mm -hmm. um, then you're in the Mavic 2 zone. The Mavic Mini, as we talked about last week, is super interesting because it's uh, below the weight limit for the FAA. And I got to say, the Mavic Mini, after a lot of research, really does get a lot of credit for being a great way to capture video in the sky. And yep. it's inexpensive. It's like three ninety nine mm -hmm. or something. And that is something that you could go buy right now as an RC pilot and uh, have in three days and be out there doing it. So it's tempting. And I haven't pulled the trigger on anything because I keep finding interesting options. Hence this article. So yep. the Scadio, let's just first, we'll talk about what we're looking at the Scadio 2 is 999. I put this in the yeah, 999. So, sub Mavic by a thousand bucks, sub Mavic 2 Pro by a thousand bucks at least. Of course, the Scadio 2 does not come with a transmitter. Um, you can fly it from your phone, but if you want the transmitter, that's another 150 bucks. So, then we have the EV2 series from Autel. This Evo. is super interesting, too. Say so what, Jason? Evo. Evo, what did I say? EV. Yeah. EV2. EV2. It's close, man. But uh, there's some cool options there. We're going to look at that. And then you get on a slightly lower scale, and it's the Femi X8 SE. I don't have this in front of me, but the thread on this on RC Groups, well, shoot, we can go look at it real it's quick. It's massive, isn't it? Check this out. The, the views. Where are the views at? Let's see if it'll show right down here. There's a lot of information that's first part of this thread. 1.5 million is what is in my head. Is it going to show it? It's probably not going to show it right here. It's anyway. on the uh, thread list view. Yeah. So over 1.5 million views for this thing, and that's why it got on the list. Um, a lot of things it doesn't have, and we can talk about that too. And then finally, the Holy Bro Copus, which we did talk about in the podcast. So We'll start out first with this guy. I just wanted to go over it slightly. It has a lot of things going for it. And one is it has uh, 43, I'm going off memory here, 45 megapixels of visual sensing. And if you compare that to the Mavic, the Ma Mavic has like 4.3. So we can go look at those stats in just a second. And then your question is, what do you mean 45 megapixels of visual sensing? And so I linked here so you could see what I'm talking about. Let's see if this works. So this guy's riding. You've told the Scotty O2 that that guy is who you're focusing on. And so it's using all those cameras that are that live all over the frame to talk to the onboard computer. And it creates a three-dimensional uh, world that it knows where it can and cannot fly, which just is mind-blowing. And um, I've got to think Scotty O might be the leader in this right now as far as getting that amount of information. It is. They have the yeah, they have the best tracking currently of any drone that's not using external sensors to the drone. Which is crazy. Yeah. It's uh, awesome. top, so when you're looking at these guys, I've realized there's some things to think about. So like the Mavic Mini, it's cheap, it's light, but if you get up and Jason Cole and I once uh, got a, a drone not as good as these uh, up into the airspace and realize soon that the wind speed, once you get high is completely not the same as when you're on the ground. And that drone started leaving town. And thanks to the quick thinking of Jason Cole, who, uh, and this is a great thing to have in your pocket. Instead of trying to fly back to ourselves, uh, Jason realized we needed to come down and get out of that wind current. And once we got out of it, then we could come home. If we'd have tried to fly home in the current, we'd never have gotten that thing back, right? Actually, we're not flying paragliders. There would what? be times where you're sitting in your paraglider and you weren't going anywhere upwind. And so the trick was to just get down low and then there's obviously more That's drag right. on the wind. So it's less, so you can penetrate. Right. So if you get that trouble up the high, bring it down low. But so that brings us to top speed, battery life, range. So uh, this guy's, I did it in miles just because I appreciate that myself. And then weight. So these were kind of the key things I was looking at. Um, the cameras are basically all 4K except for one camera on here that's 8K. Jason, is there any uh, 
application here other than uh, consumer level uh, vlogging type of stuff? There's no commercial application to any of these things, right? Um, what do you mean? I mean, like degree. no one's going to hire you to work on maybe real estate. You could use something like this. on. No, nobody's using, I mean, you know, nobody's going to use 8K right now for cinematic filming. There's not even TVs and stuff that are really readily available for that. Like nobody's using that. What they might use it for is uh, industrial um, mapping or ag industries where they can take those huge sets of data and, and map it or be able to zoom in with a, you know, detailed image, right? And but not and not for like cinematography. What You're about 4K? Let's say this uh, Scotty O2. Uh, is there any commercial uses for the Scotty O2, like real estate or? Uh, well, you could certainly use it for that. Yeah, it, it's going to be low end. Like you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to do high production value. You know, high budget. You know, professional. Like, I, I, I you know, when I say professional, I'm not just talking about commercial. I'm talking about ultra high end filming using cinematic cameras, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a different level. This is your low end drone market kind of stuff. If you wanted to use it for commercial use. So yeah, real estate photography, you know, small, you know, little clips of music videos and, you know, just low end kind of productions is what this would be used for. So have you had your hands on any of this stuff? On I have this not. Stuff? I have, I think I've flown an Evo 2. So they're small. Not the Skydio. One interesting thing about this is you can fly it using your phone, but it also has a wand that you can buy separately that allows you to point at certain parts of the sky and the drone will go where you're pointing. Have mm. you seen that, Jason? I have not. Pretty cool. I've only heard about the beacon thing, which is a thing you would have on you for better tracking. The the wand also acts as a beacon, so ah, you, okay. you can put the beacon on somebody and it will follow them. And um, the other thing is like my new Canon has a face recognition, so there's the, the there's beacon. remote. Yeah, yeah. See, it should be able to follow your dog. I don't know what the size limitation is on what it will track down to, you know, something small, but. Um, I'm sure as these things get more out there, we'll have experimentation on that and see what the limits are. And this kind of footage is what I'm talking about. All those cameras would allow you to do this in a wooded area or, a, a you know, whereas the, uh, there's another drone on there that certainly would never be good for that. Yeah. And then the amazing part is with the, all the new uh, computer uh, focal abilities that you can say, hey, this is what you're focusing on and this thing will chase you. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Um, it seems like, so if you were to use a thing like this, would you use your phone or would you use your iPad? Uh, well, that setup with the phone looks really nice. I don't know that they have an iPad mount right now. I can, I can use an iPad with my Mavic. Um, there's a 3D printed mount I have where it actually will fit in with a Mavic Mini uh, in the controller. So that one looks like it's, you know, unless you have a 3D printed modified way to do the iPad, uh, you're going to be using a phone. Controller extends range, so that's ah, really so that's one thing I see there. So it won't like remember your dog and go find it. It's not like a locator. Right. You you have to have it in the image, and it's kind of like a you draw a box over it, and it kind of highlights right. that person, and and you you're saying I'm going to track this object. So it's you kind of have to already be flying and looking at it and and select it to be tracking it, but it, it won't do it after the fact or if it's, you know, remember and, that once it's gone. And you do that in the app. You can also, it has certain uh, things that you can tell it to do, like go around the front, come around back or do figure eights around your subject. And that way you pick the shots. And then when you add the, I'm not, I sound like I'm selling this thing. I'm, I'm just interested. You're selling it to yourself. That's what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> when you have the beacon, you can then say, I want figure eight around this subject, and then you can use the beacon and manipulate the shots, or you can use the controller and manipulate where the drone is while it's giving you the shots. Yeah. So it here can, they are talking about this for yeah. work, too. It can be used for a lot of things, but I really see it working well for the the outdoor sports guys that are mountain biking or skiing or snowboarding or doing that kind of stuff. That's where it's really the best thing where somebody's not actively flying and piloting it. They want to be able to just have it chase them. Right. And that's where it's going to shine big time. 
uh, just a couple of more things on the Scotty too. One thing he, he said, two things. Uh, one was that they follow the uh, cell phone train, which means all cell phone technology is what they embrace for technology on their drones because they think that's where the most advancements are coming the quickest. Mm. And the other thing he said is uh, that he thought that drones crashing should not be a thing in the future. Like that should not even enter the equation that the uh, onboard computer should be so smart that crashing or losing your drone should never be yeah. an issue. So that's something that worries me a little bit is the fact that it works so well on that Skydia 2. But I've also seen videos where it hasn't worked so well. Like it's not a hundred percent reliable. Um, so I, I worry that it might make folks complacent and sure. like, oh, I can just go wherever I want. If even if there's trees here or whatever buildings, it's gonna go around them and not hit them. And then they then you become you know, it's already happened with the DJI stuff. You're you're not really a pilot anymore. You're an operator, and then the the more you put your faith in the technology's ability to fly itself or to stay away from obstacles or do things, the less you know skill you're going to have down the line and and be able to safely control and operate the drone. But well, that, maybe with, maybe I'm the old crickety old school guy. With that in mind, Jay, <laughs> in the first, this is a Jason Cole article. Um, but with that in mind, that, you know, these are, uh, they're telling themselves how to fly, where to fly, and how to avoid. Uh, I think that's where the Cinewhoop comes in because it completely is relying on your ability as a pilot and allows you to get shots that these other things cannot get. Jason, you want to speak on that? Yeah, so this is a, an FPV drone, and it is. It's, it's designed to be piloted in a manner that no other like Mavic, Skydio, none of that stuff is capable of. You can do loops and flips and rolls and dives and just be able to capture shots that there's no other way to do it other than a drone like this. And it's small and tiny. So you could fly it indoors. You could fly it through really small gaps in the trees um, and just be able to capture these cinematic moments um, you know, that's not possible any other way, which is what's so cool about it. These are the kinds of things we've been seeing recently on YouTube and Facebook and um, people diving down waterfalls or, or flying up and getting like three inches away from a car that's drifting or, you know, a, a mountain biker, or a BMX guy jumping and then capturing this crazy shot as it passes him in slow motion. Those are all done with mostly GoPros on racing drones, modified freestyle drones, and now these Cine Whoops are the kind of the latest thing that's doing that. I'm, I'm, was, look, I'm looking for a video. This guy flew a Cine Whoop into a, like a tap bar and a guy's playing a video game and he flew it under his arms and a guy's handing someone a beer, he flew it between his arms and then threw it by the cash register guy. And uh, it, I think that illustrates exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And so there's no there's no autopilot, there's no sensors to avoid obstacles, there's there's no return to home in this thing. It's it's all just you flying FPV in the goggles. You know, and this is actually using the DJI FPV system, which I absolutely love to death right now. Cool stuff. And so what this gives you is it sets you apart if you wanted to be a pilot out there uh, making money on your skill sets. This would set you apart from everybody else who has, you know, a DJI whatever. Yeah. So this how I guess he's got a camera. He's got his GoPro mounted backwards. He's no, no, no. He, this is a reverse shot. So okay, this is, okay. you fly this in forward, and then they reverse it in post. Well, I love that. That is so cool. Okay, we can all watch that later. <laughs> Okay, so the yeah. other the other thing up is the EVO by Autel. I'm uh, purely running off memory here. And this is the 8K drone. They actually have uh, variations of these cameras. 6K, 8K, yeah. and uh, 44 miles an hour, 40 minute battery life. And any battery life, knock 10 off and maybe add five, uh, somewhere in that range for reality. 3-axis gimbal, 5.59 miles, which is forever, 1.127 grams, which I think a little weight is always good if you're trying to get more stability up there in the wind. Yeah. And, of course, we have a, let's see, I think it's a, maybe it's a thread. Yeah. So we have a big thread here where people are talking about this. Yeah, the Evo 2, yeah, it's getting some traction for sure. 
And then we can also go to the home page where you can learn. Uh, what do you think about these new web pages, Jason? Where you scroll and you just keep getting more info? Yeah, I don't know. I think we're getting old. Well, it makes it hard on me to write a story <laughs> when all the content is a picture. You know? Yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I can't use that right there. Right. Yeah. But that's that's a selfish thing. Extended range. Wow, that is a long way away. Yeah, I'm I'm conflicted about the range on these things, but right. And so here's all your sensors. So we have twelve vision sensors, dual core processor. And do you have any thoughts on this one, Jason? Do you have any strong feelings as opposed to the sky? These are these are awesome, and they do have that thermal imaging one, and it's trying to compete with like the Mavic Two Enterprise Edition with the with the, the dual camera FLIR stuff. Um, it's good. I think a lot of guys are, are kind of moving towards this from the uh, DJI fears of information tracking back to China. Right. Um, yes. You know, they have problems Fencing. with the DJI ecosystem and information data security, that kind of stuff. Most of these don't have the fencing, which uh, would not yeah, be a thing for me. Yeah, they're about the geofencing stuff that, you know, if Link's not working or if they have a problem or, or – DJI decides that this is a no-fly zone and it's legal and perfectly acceptable. You have permission and everything about it. You should be able to fly there, but you can't. Um, these these kind of drones eliminate those issues. This thing looks pretty awesome. I had not seen this video. I guess I went right by it. Um, I'm and, and I think you're if you're looking at this, you're the kind of guy who's got a nice uh, camera for shooting videos, but you also would like to have something in the bag. Uh, if you were on vacation or by cliff or by wave and you're like, I wish I had a really cool video. So I edited myself right there, Sam. I didn't say <laughs> K-A. I said cool. Cool, cool. So 6K, you have, what is it going to show us? 8K and thermal combined. Yeah. 6K on the pro. 8K yeah. on the two. Where's pricing? Contact us for pricing. Well, okay. Yeah, dual's not available yet i don't think and this 6k uh professional is 1795 so i guarantee when you're out the door you're right there with the mavic so then you have to decide if you want to break away from dji ecosystem or not right yep and then we have one more so all of these are living in that thousand uh, dollar price range fifteen hundred dollar this is the femi x8 se and the reason i think everyone is going crazy on this thread is because it's 529 dollars the number one question you're going to ask is, what's that do? That black thing on the front that looks like a, fa a face from Star Wars. It does nothing. That does nothing? Yeah, and that's totally not cool. Don't give me a super cool Uber thing on the front that does not. It should do something. It, it, it aesthetically pleases you. That's what it, it does. It should be a light beacon. You know, when I'm way far away, it should pulsate so I can see my... Or uh, trace back and forth with realities. Like yeah, yeah, I'm sure we can make that on. happen. And then we get a million views on our viral video. Cylon drone. I like it. I like it. You could probably mod it. We can make that happen, man. Heck yeah. And for uh, this price, we go in together and then uh, we call it an investment on our video aspirations. So camera <laughs> 4K, top speed 31, average, battery life 33. That's average. I'm not saying average is bad. I'm just saying it's living right there in the spectrum of what it's expected to do. Right. Three axis gimbal, 3.1 miles average, weight 790. Pretty light, actually. Yep. And we'll go to the site and take a look. So what it doesn't have is avoidance. I think the only avoidance I ha it has is for the ground. And that's it. So this definitely would let you fly into things. Yeah. Three axis, 5K range, smart track flight, precise vision positioning. Yeah. So I think that's where all your money just went that you saved. You lost all your avoidance. Yeah, there's a lot of technology that goes into that that's missing. So that's, I mean, it should be less expensive. The big question here is camera and what kind of video you're going to get off this thing. Because at the end of the day, after the flying's done and you bring it home, the video that you get back, I think, is the most important. But of course, it's important to bring back the video. So that's where the drone comes in. Yep. It's not at the base of a mountain or something. And that's where some testing, like I remember when Unique had the, like the Q500 and I, you know, I did a review on the, maybe the, the second version of that. And it was, you know, it was a, I don't even know if it was 4K at the time, but maybe it was 2.7K or something. Um, you know, it had, it had the resolution spec that matched a DJI drone, but 
the way it worked, it didn't fly as good as a DJI. It didn't hold its position as well as a DJI. Uh -huh. And then the, the quality of the image um, wasn't as good. So there's definitely some A-B testing you want to look at. It. You can't take it on specs alone. There's a lot that goes into image quality besides just the amount of pixels it can pick up. So it's, you know, things aren't so cut and dry is, is what it looks like on paper. It, you need to look at it and see people that do really good A-B testing on YouTube or whatever. You can see uh, Vimeo or it's not as compressed as YouTube, but there's, yeah, it's not all things are created equal in that world. And that's what I was going to end with. You know, I would like to be the only guy that does videos on these things. And I have every one of these units in the back and I've done videos with Jason out at the field, but that is not the case on some of these units because they're kind of out of our realm as far as uh, having everything. But the beautiful part is there are guys on YouTube. I just do this. I do it with everything that I'm looking up. I do a Scotty O2 versus and I leave yeah. the versus yeah. empty yeah. and I do it on, uh, I go Google all. And that way I can see uh, like uh, anything that's on the internet. But then of course, YouTube always wins. And I go to YouTube and watch, especially when you're looking at these guys, you can there, I've seen videos where they'll go up and show you how stable one is in the other when you're doing like a, sh a panning shot around yourself. Right. In the same air. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, or they do the same shot at the same time of day with the same lighting to see what the camera is giving you, or they do this versus the Mavic two and show you, uh, the difference in quality of image. And those are all the things you need to figure out what you need to spend your money on. Yep. And I'm excited that I haven't landed on anything and I'm not buying anything right now because I really do enjoy the hunt. And yeah. uh, that's where we are. That's good. Good place to be. Yep. Well, I hope this has shed some light on uh, Jetty radios, how Jason uses his, some of the DJI uh, options out there or alternatives. And be sure and check out the thread. And I said in the thread, somebody uh, listed something that wasn't in my post. And I said, hey, if you have something that's not on here, I would love for you to post a link and why you think it should be. And then we all have more information on things to look at. So that's what threads are for. That's right. And P.S. I'll do a little uh, RC groups and forum and general promotion. I did a little research last week. I started looking at threads and we have threads with 1.5 million, 2 million. We had a thread that went up in November. It had 800,000 views. And so that's such a small amount of time. And the reason I did it is I was having a conversation with a company about uh, social media and the benefits of social media or forums. And my point was by finding all these threads is you're not going to find a thread that you can go to today and get information from on social media uh, that you, in a way that you can on a forum where you can go in, still interact, still get the information, still find it, key thing. So yeah. really the forum just trumps them in the head when it comes to the information you and I need to make our hobby better. Definitely, it's a, such a valuable resource. I've been using it probably since what, when did I join, 2003? And it's still viable. I believe that, uh, quote me, that the forums, much like podcasts, are going to have a resurgence in popularity when people realize uh, I, I actually need this for a reason and it and it does it well. And people yeah. are going to start moving back in the house. And, and some have gone strictly to Facebook and um, whatever that gives them, I'm sure, is instant gratification. But if you're really looking for good info, this is where you got to go. Yeah, Jason, you got anything cool planned for the weekend? Good stuff, man. No, no, no. Not this time. I've got a cool trip. I'm a kind of a surprise trip. I'm trying to plan for a one day blitz to go to Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios and Disney World. Wow. And uh, I want to buy a R2D2 like droid that's radio controlled. Right. A big one. Very basic, like a toy quality kind of controller, but it's, I, you know, I'm kind of a nerd with that. And so I want to have it for display and, and use. But so that'll be in March. So. I'm going to do a one-day blitz, free flights, fly down there the night before, spend a day at the park, and then fly back that night. It's going to be nuts, but it should be a lot of fun. You should do a time-lapse uh, video of your whole journey. There you go. Just put it on your hat. <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us in the live chat. I do have an interview scheduled next week with SoaringLab.com. Um, it's probably not going to be live. We're going to just find a time when he can chat. And so I'll have that coming for you. 
And I think that's all. Jason Cole, have a great weekend. You too, buddy. All y'all yes. out there, sit down. All right, now let's see if let's see if Jim can turn it off this week. <laughs> I know I can do it, or can I? Okay, I should have practiced, but the internet went out on me. That's why we're a little late. Okay, here we go. <laughs>